especially good to be able to greet visitors who are here with us on this Lord's Day. We are glad that you are here. We'd like to invite all of you to sign the friendship pad, which is on the inside of each row. If you will take it and pass it along. Uh, if you are new to us, we would love to have an email address or a phone number that lets us know about you and uh, provides a way for us to be in touch with you. It's always good to have uh, visitors as part of our service. we got a visitor up here to front. <laughs> and in fact, you almost kind of overlook because it looks so natural, John Lover, <laughs> to see you sitting right there. I mean, you know where you are and everything, right? Yeah, yeah, it works very well. It is a great privilege to have you back amongst us. And uh, John was here for uh, the wedding of uh, the Shulby wedding yesterday, and he's here honoring us by preaching today and performing a baptism. Welcome to the family. Uh, and so it's very special have you and then personally for the two of us to be able to renew acquaintance and uh, have some time for conversation and that kind of thing. Uh, Jamie Roper is on the premises. Now, there she is. I thought it'd be about the same place as Jamie, so very good. Good to see both of you all. Good news to go has some things. First, a pastoral concern. Many of you have heard that our friend George Bailey has died after a time of illness. Um, the service for George will be on Tuesday. 1.30 down in the chapel, uh, and there will be a visitation at Pearson's funeral home tomorrow afternoon from 4 until 7. So visitation tomorrow, 4 to 7, service at the chapel at 1.30 uh, at, uh, uh, on, on Tuesday. So we certainly want to remember Peggy and uh, other members of this family in our prayers during this time. Let me call your attention to the things that are in the uh, Good news to go. Hope you will read all those carefully. Uh, the preschool, Harvey Brown Preschool, is having an open house this coming Friday morning from 9:30 to 10:30. So if you've always wanted to see what's going on with the preschool, you can do that this weekend. And then food truck, followed by pipes and pumpkins, is this coming uh, Friday. And that will be a very special time. Uh, the weather should be good, and so uh, we invite all of you to come out and enjoy food truck and then pipes and pumpkins following that. I'm looking for Alex Bumpus. Is he here? There he is. Come on up and enjoy. I just didn't, just, I'm overlooking everybody today, Alex. Sorry about that. During this time, we are preparing for our season of stewardship, and we're asking different people in the church to say a word about their life and what the church means to them. And today is Alex Bumpus. speech here. Um, appreciate that. So my story is this. Um, my father was a Presbyterian minister and so I've been a Presbyterian all my life and uh, one of the conditions when we got married was that we stay Presbyterian. And so um, we, Sarah and I went looking for a, a Presbyterian church and we didn't want to go to the one that my mother and father were members so we wanted our own church, so we visited a half a dozen churches, and um, when we visited here, um, we liked it. Although it was still in the gym, uh, we weren't here, we still, we thought it was, well, it was a good fit. And um, at the time, the music was great, the preacher was okay, and uh, <laughs> you know, some, some things we liked uh, about Harvey Brown. Um, one of the things was that um, it was very welcoming. And, um, you know, the first time we came, we got the welcome, the whole shebang, and, and the basket of muffins, and an uh, and invitation back. And um, my aunt and uncle were, were members here, so we felt like we had family there too. Um, so <clears throat> we started to come pretty regularly and took the membership classes. We knew we wanted to start a family, and um, at the time, I knew that I wanted my children to grow up kind of the way I did in church, and that was just, you know, a place for them to call home and run around and people to say hi and, and always know who they are and who they belong to and, and, uh, and kind of teach them and, and grow, uh, grow as, uh, as they do. Um, it was big enough, you know, I thought Harvey Brown is just big enough to be, you know, a place where we can get involved if we want to, but we don't feel like we have to. 
Um, you know, if we just want to sit back and come to church on Sunday, we can, or we can get involved um, as, as, um, as much as we want to. Um, some big things came around in life. Uh, we had children, and as soon as our firstborn, Francis, was born, there was John Roper at the door. I think he was our first visitor. <laughs> and um, so that was welcoming. And then things went on, and, and um, we had our second child, Jane, who had some complications. And she had some heart issues, and for the first six weeks of her life, she was uh, in the hospital um, getting fixed. And it was a rough and hard time. Um, but every day, somebody would call and say, can we come see you, right? Or they'd come down, hey, we're in the lobby. Um, and it was great. I mean, that was comforting. And, and I really, I really like that it's so much that we had to say, you know, back off a little bit. You know, you're coming. But, and they were willing to do that. They always said, you know, use this as much or as little as you want. And, and we did. And uh, that's always been a comforting thing, and I've always felt like <clears throat> this was a great church home and church family to have, um, especially during those, those times. And even now when Jane has her surgeries, we, um, Bill has always come down and done, done just a perfect prayer for her to kind of um, soothe our anxieties and, and uh, get her going on, on some of the things that she needed to, she needed to do. Um, <clears throat> so... Now we have a, uh, a nice family, and it's always comforting to know that uh, we have the church behind us, and this is our home, this is their home, this is where we, we come to pray and worship God and, and uh, be who we, whoever we are and who we can be. Um, <clears throat> now Sarah's a little too involved. Um, she's heading up the search committee for the, uh, for the new pastor, and, um, but we really... We really enjoy our, our Wednesday nights, and, and the girls are in choir, and, and uh, thought it, I think it was, a, it was a good choice for us, and uh, we, we appreciate it. It's good to see you all, and Francis and Jane are here. Uh, friends, we are in the presence of the Lord. Let us gather now.
Even in the midst of great joy and celebration, we know that our lives don't always reflect God's intentions. So please join me in the prayer of confession in the bulletin. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our failure to be who you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our The song does not ever have to end. The joy does not ever have to be forgotten. And the celebration does not ever have to fade because God's grace does not ever stop surrounding us, loving us, healing us, and making us new each and every day. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's continue to give thanks to God and share the peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ. 
Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and not what God, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in help long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them, and when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on earth. Thanks be to God. So I have my great big backpack. Anybody else have a backpack? You guys have a backpack for school? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's at home. You have a digital backpack at school? Well, I think that's gonna be a lot lighter than my great big backpack here. So what do you guys put in your backpacks? Toys. Mm-hmm. Toys. Anybody put any books in their backpack? An agenda? A lunchbox? Your folder for your homework? Yeah. Anybody else put anything cool in it? What? Your folder? Yeah. So that you can bring notes back and forth? Your monkey? Okay. So, um, we're at the age, obviously, up here where books aren't necessarily something that go to school or come home from school, but eventually you guys are gonna have books. So one of the things that books do is that they tell you information and they tell you what to do. They give you instructions, right? Who has ever had somebody give you instructions, right? Hopefully everybody, you know, whether it's instructions on how to brush your teeth or instructions on how to clean your room um, or how to behave at the dinner table. Has anyone ever had instructions that weren't very good? Yeah, like, like saying, go clean your room. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean everything just is in a pile, as long as it's not on the floor? Does it mean put all your clothes back into the drawers? Yeah, shove it all in your closet. I'm not really sure those are good directions, right? You do it sometimes. So I have some books that are in my bag. And these are all very special books. And in our family, called the church family, we all have a very important book and um, that gives us instructions. Do you guys know what that is? The Bible. All right. So this is a Bible. This is a very special Bible. Does it look like it's old or brand new? Like it's old? Okay. And it's also in a different language. I don't know if you guys can see that. No, it's German. It's actually German. Because do you think that people in Germany or Russia or China can read our English Bibles? No, probably not. So this one's in German. And this was one of Will's families. And the date that somebody wrote in here was 1867. Whoa. Whoa. So this Bible has been in our family for an extremely long time. So it's really, really special. And then I've got one in here that's kind of small, like this, right? It's relatively new. I don't use it much, unfortunately, <clears throat> I must confess. Um, but it's got little tiny words. And so you could put this in your purse or your backpack, and you could take it with you so that you have what you need when you go someplace. And there's a really cool Bible that's come out lately. And what does this one look like? What's special about this one? Well, I opened it up to the songs, yeah, but what does it look like on the sides? What's, what's in the sides? 
vine. So it's a special one that you can use to take notes. It's got a space that you can write in it on purpose so that if there's something that's important to you, that you could write a note about it. And it's made just for that. But there's other Bibles. There's ones that are teeny tiny, like this. You guys ever seen these maybe in the hotel that you've stayed at? There's a little tiny Bible in the hotel. Yeah? So this one um, is Will's. It was given to him in 1972 after he was born. <laughs> um, I won't say how long after he was born, but it wasn't right when he was born. So, um, And then I got a special Bible here. This one I got when I turned eight years old. It's, it's ripped. It's got some stuff in it. And it's got um, somewhat like that. Um, it's got highlighter. I highlighted what was important to me, right? And I underlined it. And there was stuff that people gave me that was important. And I put little notes from things that I did in here. Um, it's shaped like a foot because it was a service project. So we were doing God's work, being his, his hands and feet. And then whenever I went anywhere, whether it was for um, a church camp or whether it was on a mission trip, I had the people sign my Bible. So I have a record, and I have prayers from everybody that were on those activities with me, and it's a good way to remember how much that I have a family in Christ way, way, way far away. So the one that we use here in church, we don't read um, from all the time, and we only read it. We don't write in it. So it's easy to read, but I don't think I'd like to take this with me all the time and carry it around. Do you guys think that would be a good thing or not so good? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> I'd, work on, I'd work on my strength, that's for sure. All right, and then here's a little teeny tiny one as well. So we've got ones that are really big and ones that are really little. And Eric got this one when he was born. A neighbor gave it to us. So um, somebody told me one time that Bible stands for something special. B-I-B-L-E. Do you guys know what that stands for? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Because we know at the end that Jesus wins and we all get to go to heaven because Jesus loves us. But we have to have directions on how to live before we get to that point. So the Bible is our instruction book. And so in order to make sure that everybody has an instruction book in third grade, our church decides that we are going to give our third graders an instruction book, give them a Bible. You're a third grader? Okay. So we have a special presentation for our third graders. start tweens, which is between the early elementary and they're going to youth group. Eric, here we go. And Annie Welch, I know they're on fall break. And then Turner Effender, right there. And you said you're in the I want to give you a Bible too. I can have your name put in it if you let me know after worship. So these are for you to read at home. You can bring them to Sunday school. You can um, bring them to tween group when we do Bible study. Um, so these are your very own Bibles to have at home. And with these new Bibles, you can also write in them. You can mark things. There's stickers, I think, if there's something that really means something special to you. So it's yours, it's your textbook, it's the one that you need to learn. So go ahead and everybody put your hands together and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your instructions that help us to live in a good ways. 
the Bible teaches us how to show your love to other people. Amen. If you guys are staying, you can stay. If not, you can go with Julie back to the children's area. want to make sure this is on, and it is good. I'm not doing so, don't do any better with microphones than I did when I was here before, back a year, a little over a year and a half ago. It's such a pleasure to be back today, it has been wonderful, yesterday was wonderful, the day before was wonderful, we've been in town, um, got to play some golf, got to do a wedding, got to enjoy a lot of good folks, and one of the great things about being back has been that uh, years when I was in Nashville, I used to play golf at a nine-hole golf course, and one day I go there to play, there was a starter, the person who would match you up with uh, a group if you were by yourself, because uh, they didn't like singles to go out on the golf course, and so uh, I go in the bathroom, and there's a man hiding in there, <laughs> and I, I, I I didn't know what to say, and he realized that I thought this looked pretty silly, and he said, there's a guy there I really don't want to play with today, and so I'm going to hide in here until he leaves. <laughs> so when I came back, I was real glad to see a lot of you not darting in the bathroom so that you didn't have to see me when I walked through the door. Uh, it's, it's been nice to have those warm welcomes. Our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Timothy, reading from the 3rd chapter, verse 14, through the 4th chapter, verse 5. Listen for the word of God to you. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how... From childhood, you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped with every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. <laughs> when I retired, I was confronted with an interesting problem, and that is since I was in high school and felt called to go into ministry, I knew what my purpose was in life. Uh, I loved being a minister and having a church and, and being a part of everything that ministers do. Uh, I enjoyed those trips to the hospital, and we never told Alex, but we would, Bill would call, and he'd say, it's okay for you to come, Alex is not here, and we would go down and see Jane. But um, I loved all of that, and then I, I retired, and all of a sudden I thought, 
what do I do now? I, I, you know, what's, what's my purpose now that I'm not serving a church? I was reminded uh, when I was in York, South Carolina, a uh, rural area, and uh, there was a man in the church that died tragically in a boating accident. He was uh, early 30s. He had two young children. And uh, everyone in the community flocked over to the house. And the women from the community came in, and they brought casseroles. And one woman came in, and she started writing down the names of everyone bringing casseroles. And another woman was turning over, was making out little name tags and putting them on all the dishes so they could be returned. And another one was in the kitchen getting stuff out of the refrigerator. And another one was in there cooking. And it just went on and on. And where were the men? They were standing out in the yard under a tree smoking cigarettes. because they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what their purpose was in that moment. And I, so when I retired, I thought, okay, now what do I do? What is that purpose in life? And so you, you go, and I, and I go out to Texas, and immediately I uh, hurt my back, and I got to spend a lot of nights sleeping in the recliner, and, um, had way too much time to think about things that I didn't want to think about, to try to figure this out. And the harder I tried to figure it out, the more elusive it seemed to be. I did finally start working at the church. And I'm a parish associate doing what Bill used to do in his earlier life, uh, doing visitation, I do a little teaching, uh, don't do preaching, which is driving me crazy because I got all those good stories about John Montgomery, and, <laughs> and, and, and I can't use any of them. Uh, I, I, it's terrible. It's really terrible. Um, it's awful to have this much ammunition and to have nothing to do with it. But, the, but I started thinking about what is it that I'm called to do now? And I began to think about it, and this happens to be the lectionary scripture reading for today, so I won't make some great claim that would not be true, that I poured through the Bible to find some place that made sense to me. But it, the, in the work of the Spirit, this scripture talks about how the faith comes to us from our ancestors. It's passed on to us. He talks about Lois and Eunice, your mother and your father and your grandmother, how that faith comes to you, and now you are to cherish it and to pass it on. And I began to think about the fact that now my call was to pass, to help be a part of passing that faith on to my grandchildren. And so now when we sit in worship with them and, and they're crawling all over us and, and, and my wife is is being wonderful with them and I'm sitting there going oh please Lord let me endure this hour <laughs> I, I keep saying to myself this is what I'm called here to do but life has a way of tricking you you know when I was uh, much younger working on the farm with my dad and we had an old truck it was a 1952 flatbed Chevrolet truck. Skip Light probably had one uh, when, when he was 40. But anyway, he, sorry Skip. But, but that old truck sat in our side yard and it had a long stick shift in the center of the floor and I would go out there and shift those gears uh, when my dad wasn't home to tell me not to. And it had a granny gear. You don't see many cars with granny gears anymore. Um, but what my dad would do, he would go, we would go out into the cotton field after the cotton had been picked and put in the sheets, and he would take that truck and he would get it in the ruts, the cotton rows, and he would put it in that granny gear, and I would walk along behind the truck. He would go along in the truck, and then every once in a while he would jump out, run back, and help me throw that cotton on the back of the truck. And the truck would just walk its way down the field. 
I used to kind of think about life like that. It was like life slowed down to my speed. That's what, when I look back on things and when I long for it to be the way it used to be, that's kind of the way I think about it. But you know, life probably never was that way and it certainly isn't that way now. We had um, our older grandchildren, eight and 10, over at our house. They came there in Batesville, Arkansas. They came down to Dallas to spend a week with us and we invited Austin, our five-year-old grandson that lives there in Dallas, over to be with us. And we're, they, they're gonna spend the night and we are in there and uh, we entertain them which means Janie entertained them. And she had done all this wonderful stuff with them, but we were so worn out when they went to bed. We were so excited. <laughs> and they went to bed, and, and I was sleeping, and uh, my back started hurting, and I got up and I, I sat in the recliner in the den, and about five that morning, there's a face. <laughs> uh, you, that sensation you have when you go, uh, if you've ever had a dog or a cat, you can, but the, and Austin is standing right next to me, and he tells me that he's had a little uh, bladder issue in bed. And you know, I did what any loving grandfather would do. I went and got his grandmother. <laughs> And, and we finally, uh, Janie got up and, and she restored order and um, she be, uh, began to uh, get ready to cook some breakfast for them. And about that time I get a text from my son-in-law, uh, Austin's father, and he says, our three-year-old Connor wants to come over because he's so sad to not be with the other boys. And of course, I told my wife, I said, Tim must be playing golf today. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know we're onto them. But so uh, everything had settled down and we were comfortable. And the doorbell rings, just like that. And the doorbell rings, and all of a sudden, Connor, the three year old, comes flying through the door. I mean, never slowed down. He runs through, he tags Daniel, he tags uh, Jordan, he tags Austin, and he says, tag your it, tag your it, tag your it. And he keeps running around and around and around. And I thought, oh. <laughs> but that's the way life really is now. It's not that old truck creeping down the field. It's that tag your it world that we're living in, and we're trying to find a solid footing in this tag your it kind of world that's moving so fast, and it's so hard for us to keep up with, and it's so hard to know where we stand. And this scripture from 2 Timothy talks about the power of God's word to help you find that foundation in your life that can direct your way. It's not going to slow things down to a granny gear by any means. But what it's going to do is that word is going to give you a solid place to stand and a way of understanding your life and a way of moving forward in that life. When you think about how you got to where you are, the writer of 2 Timothy mentions his mother, and you've heard me talk about my mother many times. She had her 98th birthday in September, and uh, except for some back pain, she's doing quite well. Um, and, and my sister said, well, Mom, what do you want for your birthday? And she said, I want a new car. <laughs> She's 98, she does not drive. 
She does have her license, thanks to the miracle of, medic, you know, of the medical situation that we're in these days. You know, she's had cataract surgery. She sees better than she has in years. She's got hearing aids. She hears better than she has in years. Um, but but she, she wanted a new car. And, and, and Jay and I laughed about that and laughed about that and thought that's just the most absurd thing ever. But, you see, I began to think about the things I learned from my mother. My mother is the most determined human being on the face of the earth. Um, I remember when I was in high school, after my dad was so sick and disabled, um, one night, uh, one morning early, my mother woke me up and she said, the pump has lost prime. When you live in the country, you have a pump that pumps the water. You know that, that it was an electric pump. And it had lost prime. And so my mom said, we don't have any water. I'm going to go down to the barn, and I'm going to get some water to prime the pump, and I need you to be up and ready to prime it when I get back. So she comes back a little later than I thought she would with the water. And her face is bruised on the side a little bit, and she's got this dirt on her sleeve. And I said, Mom, what happened? It turned out that she had parked the car at the top of the little hill and left it running in neutral and gone down to lean over and get the water out of the faucet there at the, that we had hogs in that pasture. And as she's leaning over to get the water, the car starts rolling and knocks her into the hog pen. Now, what did my mother do? She finished getting the water, she brushed herself off, she came back to the house and then told that story on herself. I said, Mom, you want a new car in 98, and the last time I remember us having a car conversation, it was because you let your own car run over you. Really, are you sure about this? No. But I realized that the reason she wanted that car, it was her way of saying, I haven't given up hope. I wake up every day and think about living, not dying. Now we're all thinking about her dying because she's 98. But her approach to life has always been one day at a time, trusting in God to get her through that day. You know I've told that story way too many times. I'm not going to tell it again about Uncle T Smiley teaching me to pray. But my mother taught me about persistent prayer that Luke talks about today in the reading that Micah read. That mom prays every day. And that's what enabled her to deal with my dad all those years when she'd get up in the morning and get him out of bed and put him in the tub and bathe him and then wash it, put his clothes in the washing machine to wash and then make his lunch and then sit him in his chair and June Breeden, the man that lived over behind us, would come to take care of him during the day while she went to work. That's how she survived. The writer of Timothy says, think about those things that you've learned from your ancestors that give you the strength to face life every day and realize those things are based in the Word of God. You find that strength in the Word of God and you share that Word of God with others because the time is coming when people aren't going to be willing to accept it. The time is coming when people aren't going to want to believe it and you've got to be firm in your faith in that word. These are confusing times. I called, I was going to visit somebody in the hospital, and I called the hospital, and uh, they told me he's in room 321 in the delirium unit. You know, I see you, I know about, I know about delirium unit. So I go to see him. Uh, and uh, talk to him. He's obviously pretty confused. And so I come out of there, and now the hospitals in Dallas are made a little different. There's not a single straight hall in Dallas, Texas in a hospital. 
They curve around, they do this, they go off to the right, they go off. You'll be walking down the hall and say, oh, 321's that way, you know. And so I came out, my sense of direction, which is just as terrible now as it was when I was with you, and I couldn't remember how to get out of there. So I walked up to the nurse's station and asked how to get out, and she pointed to the door. Well, I'm walking to the door, and of course, I see a bathroom just off to the left. Well, now you know, I never pass a bathroom. Trust me. When you get my age, you'll know what I mean if you're a man. All right. So I, I never pass a bathroom. I try not to pass people in need, but I certainly never pass a bathroom. So I go in the bathroom, and I come out, and I think, you know, I'm going to ask the nurse what the purpose of this delirium unit is, since I'd never heard of one before. And as I'm walking back toward her, she says, Sir, the other door. <laughs> and I noticed she was already looking for me a room. <laughs> These are confusing times. It is no wonder that we have delirium units. And the writer of Timothy says, it's time for you to dig back in to God's word and to find your foundation at that place where God meets you and loves you and seeks to lead you. It's a tag you are it world. And you need to remember that the one who is really it is found in the scripture. And the one that is there for you to help you find your footing is in the word as well. Grace and peace to you. And thanks for letting me come back and be with you today. Evidently not. There we go. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the close of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. Read Matthew Baldwin to receive the sacrament of baptism. Dana and John, do you desire Reed be baptized? We do. 
Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child? Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide Reed by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and be a faithful member of the Church? We do. With the whole church, let us renounce our sins. Do you renounce all evil and the powers in the world which defy God's righteousness and love? I renounce Do you renounce the ways of sin that separate you from the love of God? I Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? I Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love to your life's end? With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended from the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, our Creator, thank you for your faithful promise in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your Son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, Baptize with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word, and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. God, who calls us from death to life, we give ourselves to you, and with the church through all the ages, we thank you for your saving love. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Come here, Reed. When I did the wedding for your mom and dad, we were kind of hoping for something like you to be the result of that. Oh, wait, that was Grandma and I. Were. Reed Matthew. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wow, such a good baby. <laughs> you may be seated. Let me introduce this newest member to you. This is Reed, and he's heavy but he is solid. We are thankful for the wonderful expression that tells me that he can't wait to learn more about you and about God and about God's love. He's a sponge right now waiting to absorb the good things that you help him to absorb. He's going to learn about love. He's going to learn about forgiveness. He's going to learn about hope. He's going to learn about the promises of God from you. That's the job that you're undertaking, to teach him about that love, to help him know that he belongs to God and that God has chosen him. You know, we're Presbyterians, and we believe God chooses us, and we believe God chooses all people, and we believe God has chosen him this day through this baptism. And we give thanks for that. And we give thanks for God entrusting us with him and his Christian education. And if he could stare at me any harder, <laughs> what beautiful eyes. Thanks be to God.
baptism, you claimed us, and by your spirit, you are at work in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Reed to this time and place. Establish him in your truth and guide him by your spirit. That together with all your people, he may grow in faith, hope, and love, and be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Reed is now received into Christ's church. Let us welcome the newly baptized. With joy and Thanks be to God. this day ours are prayers of thanksgiving. We especially are grateful this day, O oh Lord, for the presence of John Roper in the leadership of worship. His presence here today causes us to look back with gratitude for his gifts to this church, for the days that he guided this congregation, for those who were led to faith by his example and influence. Continue to bless him and Jamie and bless John's work as parish associate of the Preston Hollow Church. Even as John's presence causes us to look back with joy for his service, we also look ahead as a congregation. Be with the pastor nominating committee in their search. Give them patience and energy and wisdom in that important work. Guide them to the one who you have already chosen to lead this congregation into the future that belongs to Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask your blessing on those on our prayer list and for others who need your prayers. Especially this day, we ask your blessing on the family of George Bailey, with his wife Peggy, with his children, with all others who grieve in his death. Even in times of death, O oh Lord, make us thankful that beyond the power of death, is your much greater promise of life, that you have overcome every power to hurt or destroy. All praise to you, O God. All glory to you, O Christ. All blessing to you, Holy Spirit. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent. And hear us now as we delight in joining together to pray as Christ taught us, as we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are reminded in so many ways on this day of the blessings of God to us in grateful response. Let us bring our gifts and tithes unto the Lord.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters. We thank you for the precious gift of baptism. By water and the Holy Spirit, you have given us for the forgiveness of sin. And us to new life grace. Sustain us, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Help us know and love you. For
it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. This is a little resolution for John. Whereas John Roper has the distinction of being the longest serving pastor in the history of Harvey Brown Church, having served in that capacity from January 1997 to April 2018, and whereas under his leadership, the church launched new ministries, completed two successful capital campaigns, celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2016, and enhanced its reputation for outstanding worship, music, Christian education, and service to others. And whereas he sought to strengthen the church and its ministries by developing leaders to share in this work, and whereas his love for this congregation, his pastoral presence in the lives of its members knew no bounds, and whereas he served the Presbyterian Church, USA, beyond Harvey Brown as moderator of Mid-Kentucky Presbytery and as a commissioner to the 223rd General Assembly. And whereas, through his ministry, he embodied a central tenet of the Reformed tradition that the grace made known to us in our Lord Jesus Christ shapes all that we do in the life of the church. Now, therefore. <laughs> In recognition of his devotion to God and his service to this congregation, the session of Harvey Brown Memorial Presbyterian Church is hereby bestow upon Reverend John Roper the honorary title of Pastor Emeritus. <laughs> I cannot tell you, one, how surprised I am, and two, how overjoyed I am to receive this, and uh, I'm glad that the print is large enough for me to read. <laughs> and uh, you know I have always loved you, and the wonderful thing was you loved me back, and that has changed my life. Thank you so much. Stay right there. Following the service, we're going to have a wonderful reception down in Emory Hall, and I'm going to ask Janie if she would to start making her way in this direction, and we're going to kind of sneak out the back door, so we'll be there to be able to greet all of you when the service is over. But for now, dear friend, let me hold that thing for a minute, and your bulletin, and why don't you again pronounce the blessing and benediction okay. this congregation. Go into the world seeking to be faithful to that word that has called you to this place, loving each person you meet, being courageous to tell the truth of the gospel about God's love for all people everywhere. And now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>